Welcome back, podcast fans. I'm your host, Annette Hines, and this is Parenting Impossible, the special needs survival podcast. So I'm here today with Benjamin Liu and Jenny Huang. Did I say that right? I hope so. Oh, yes. good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we've just been having a nice conversation about the difference between inspiration and motivation. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, so Benjamin is a, a really incredible person. He's accomplished something that uh, I certainly have, you know, could not do as well as many of my peers, which is to be accepted to and be um, surviving and thriving and and uh, really like hitting it out of the park at MIT, a very uh, noble institution to say the least. Um, he's winning prizes in mathematics and we're going to lead into all of that. So he is really top in the charts for personal accomplishments, but he's also a person with a disability. He's living with SMA. And we want to talk about that. And we want to talk about the relationship between Jenny, his mom, and him, and what his family has been able to do to support his dreams. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having, having me. us. So um, I think I want to start with Jenny. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the early years and, and the diagnosis of SMA and what SMA is really all about? Yeah, first, let me introduce what is the SMA. SMA represents the spinal muscular atrophy. It's a progressive, debilitating motor neuron disease. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, ALS. People, most people know that. But yeah. starting from the infant. Mm -hmm. So Ben is on the weak side of SMA. And uh, his more his um his physical disability his physical disability is very general, so he relies on caregiver to provide the care mm -hmm. for twenty seven with all the daily life activities, mm -hmm. and his lung capacity is about twenty twenty. 5% and his motor neuron development is about 10% of normal child. And also he is facing a challenge with a series of secondary uh, complications. Mm -hmm. So life uh, before, like death before 20, it's very normal. Mm. So when we have this uh, diagnosis, we all feel devastated okay. and we feel like destroyed and you feel like the whole world crash in front of you just and uh, you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And for me, because I love my ch ch children so much and I don't want to be defeated and at one time I feel this is a uh, terrible, terrible disease. So I want to get myself up and trying to equip myself with better problem solving skill. So basically it's fighting back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that started your journey as an advocate. You wrote about that in your op-ed. Uh -huh. um, that moved me to tears. I have to say, as a parent of a child who passed away at 17 from a complicated neuromuscular degenerative disorder, oh, I, you know, I was that. right there with you. I, I felt oh, it, you know, it, know, it's, you know, Benjamin, this has nothing to do with our children. We love our children so much. We're not disappointed in them, but, uh -huh. but we, it's a loss. For us, it's a loss of a dream that we had of what our relationship was going to look like with this child, what the child was going to be able to accomplish and do. And so, you know, it takes a minute to regroup, right, Jenny? Yeah. It's like maybe I never feel I'm enough for this kind of challenges. Challenge, yeah. Even you're mm -hmm. sick in the growth every moment, you're trying to like, 
explore new idea, explore different ways, and trying to learn from everyone, everywhere, you still feel it's not enough. Mm-hmm. But at another time, because uh, surviving this disease is also almost impossible. But at this period, with my intervention and also we get a support from outside, mm-hmm. we are, at least we can achieve Ben's relative health at this mm-hmm. stage so that he has the energy to endure the MIT strict coursework. Right. And he's healthy, he's like immune system is quite strong, which is amazing to the his specialist. Mm-hmm. And that's related to the care that he's getting at home from his family and the support that he gets from what we call our circle of care, you know, your team, yes. uh-huh. your close-knit team. Um, ben spoke about that. You have to connect and I'll have the link for you and watch his... Um, his YouTube video, accepting the Alibaba Global Mathematics Competition Award. It definitely will give you goosebumps. Um, And Ben, you were so generous to thank your family and your mom for everything that they've done and continue to do to support your goals. Um, Yeah, that's definitely very important. Yeah. So Ben, tell us, like, as you're, you know, hitting your teenage years and you're turning out to be this mathematical genius. Yay. Um, I love math too. So, yeah. you know, why MIT? Why MIT? Well, a um, couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it's sort of like, sort of in the math community, uh, sort of the community I was in of like people who are doing math competitions. It's like, uh, it's got great, acclaim there Mm -hmm. so like um it's sort of like the natural choice of where uh we nerds will just like nerd out (laughs) to so um not saying like of course there are like other great institutions too but like mit really stands out in that respect um furthermore uh there's been i sort of wanted to go someplace where there was also an entrepreneurial uh streak Mm -hmm. in, in that I'm also interested in assistive technologies and like building mm-hmm. assistive technologies. So I'm actually the vice president of uh, the assistive technology club at MIT. Uh, nice. And um, yeah, so I think I wanted to select a place that had like sort of uh, an innovative streak. And um, so basically all things considered, I chose MIT. So yeah. how, were, how were you welcomed there? How was I welcomed there? Um, yeah, with open arms, reluctantly, you know, what was your entree like there, your beginning? Well, I guess I was welcomed like any other student. Uh, I'm not sure like how best to put that, but um, I mm-hmm. guess like, so firstly, there's this campus preview weekend uh, that mm-hmm. like MIT hosts to like sh- basically show uh, admits what it is like to be at MIT. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was like, and of course, all the, all the schools had some sort of preview weekend, but I was like, MIT's weekend was like far and away more interesting than the other schools. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, you're yeah. not the only wheelchair user on campus, clearly. Um, I think it's harder to see. It's like he's probably well seen at the campus, MIT campus, at this, I can say. And I also want to add something for Ben's. Uh, ben is the guy who set the standards very high. He wants mm-hmm. to accept the toughest challenges. And the, MIT is the toughest challenge with all the genius comes together. Right. And also MIT is the most employable institute. So by choosing this way, it's also a preparation for him to be independent financially in the mm-hmm. future. So I, I just want to add this two point. That's a yeah. great point. So rather than taking your diagnosis and just 
you know, giving up or feeling bad about yourself, you've been resilient as a person in a way that maybe some of us would not have been able to do. And you continue to set high goals for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're a high achiever. Where do you feel like you get that from? Well, thank you. Um, I think I get that from sort of, I want to do something like, I want my life to have meanings. Like, I want to yeah. like, not just fritter my life away. I want to be here for a reason. And I want to like, make something great happen and make the world yeah. a better place. So sort of, that's my underlying motivation for a lot of things. So Ben, remind everybody listening, how old are you? I'm, I'm 20. Yeah, he's 20. And he's setting goals that many of our college students don't set for themselves at 20, regardless of disability or non-disability. So I think it's just important to note that, you know, that um, we have a person here who is not only resilient, but like Jenny said, he's setting the bar and he's modeling for the next, you know, folks coming up, what you can achieve if you just continue to work at it. That does not mean that there aren't barriers, right? Right. You, you face barriers, you face challenges all the time, and not the least of which is something we call ableism, where people will look at you and assume things about you without really knowing you and knowing what you can do. Yes. Yeah. Most people will look at someone in a wheelchair and assume that they have an intellectual disability as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Do you but encounter I, that at all? I'm not sure I encounter it necessarily because I am an MIT student. Um, so like, mm -hmm. I think people just like assume that, you know, probably <laughs> if you got to MIT, probably not, but I'm not sure. Like may maybe, maybe uh, they do, uh, but I haven't, nobody's told me that <laughs> but uh what i do get the sense is that like first they see me as like just a disabled person um just like you know that's the main thing they see and then mm -hmm. after a while they see me as like a uh person who has like done a bunch of like accomplishments mm -hmm. um and then finally like Finally, after more time, they might see me like as just like just another person with the, you know, desires of any other normal person to have friends, to be loved, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Tell us a little bit about what those social experiences are like for you. Do you feel like you're getting the typical college experience? Well, define typical, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good, excellent point, actually. Yeah, but um, like in terms of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Friends, you know, um, someone that you care about closely, dating, uh, going to parties, all of that stuff. Yeah, well, I have friends. Um, I'm not sure I would characterize myself as a party person. Uh, mm -hmm. I would much rather sit like one-on-one -on -one and have a long philosophical discussion uh, as opposed to like uh, go around like a million of people in uh, parties and uh, mm -hmm. do small talk for like five hours. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah, um, now I guess in terms of uh, dating, I'm not really sure <laughs> because, uh, well, I mean, or he doesn't just... want to say in front of his mom. I, I'll just uh, like say that. <laughs> I think he would be okay. <laughs> so you just speak from your heart. What do you think about this? Oh, I can leave. I'm trying to just <laughs> illustrate for people who are not clear that, you know, the typical experience, and granted, that's on a range for college students, is possible for someone who's a wheelchair user and mm -hmm. someone who has physical limitations and healthcare challenges. And I, I think that's why I love to do these interviews, not because they make me feel good, but because they really can provide a, a model for people to jump off from and to take some action steps in their life. And look at 
all things are possible. All things are possible. Yeah. So I know that you require a lot of support, physical support to get through your day every day, <laughs> but it is challenging to find people who can provide that level of support to you. And then of course, there's the cost associated with it. So yeah. why don't you tell me a little bit about what your support plan looks like right now? Who do you have supporting you on a day-to-day -day basis? Because you require 24 hour support. So what does that look like? Yeah, so that looks like, uh, well, a big part of it is my mom, uh, like Lion's share. Um, she does so much for me, like from the morning to the night. Um, mm -hmm all my physical needs, like going to the bathroom, eating, showering, putting on clothes, uh, monitoring, like to make sure my body doesn't fall out of position, stretching, exercises, massages, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so it's a lot. Um, and I'm very grateful that I have her to do all that for sure. Um, I also have a nurse who came with me from California his name mm -hmm. is Conrado, and he helps out during the night uh, so that, for instance, my mom can get some sleep uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, <laughs> and uh, and sometimes I, we also have like other, like another nurse, maybe from the nursing agency, who maybe comes like a day or two in a mm -hmm. week. But um, yeah, so mostly it's, it's uh, pretty concentrated in my mom and and then my nurse from California, his name is Conrado. Um, so really grateful to have them, but um, at the same time, it's gonna be tough if like uh, some, it's gonna be hard to replace if, if something mm -hmm. happens to one of my caregivers for sure. Yeah. Jenny, have you thought about, you know, the fact that you moved across the country to be there every day for Ben? Um, you know, before the pandemic, I never thought about Ben will go to college. And we originally said maybe find uh, some research topic he can start mm -hmm. doing it. But then after the pandemic, we feel like maybe online is possible. And then he applied this field college. He was ex he applied for college. He was accepted three including Harvard, MIT, and Caltech. And he wow. chose MIT. Wow. So then, and then he wants to come. Mm -hmm. That's a huge decision. You know, I was facing another new, harder challenge. Right. I'm not ready for it. So that's, uh, and uh, I was sick. I was depressed. But then I want to support Ben as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So we, I have a hard time for the past several years to do the preparation. Yeah. And uh, finally we arrive here and then I actually feel that my, in order to support Ben well, and it, it might be good for me to back to as a student so I can dedicate more time, quality time to take care of Ben and also improve myself skill. Mm -hmm. So I think I will chase the time away from my more comfortable house. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that way we can prepare Ben better for the future. Are you living together? Days. Are you living together in an apartment now? Yes. yes. Okay. So you're not living in a dorm, Ben. Yeah, we live in the graduate, the MIT graduate housing. So it's a two bedroom apartment. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they were able to accommodate you to do that. Wonderful. Yeah, we yeah we tried some effort to communicate with MIT administration. Mm -hmm. So for several months, we finally, we are able to get this kind of setting, which is great. We are very appreciate for their support. Okay. 
do you ever think about the day when it's appropriate for your mom to not be your one-to-one -one caregiver? Ben, this is for you. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, I do think about this day. Um, I'm not quite sure I have a plan <laughs> for this mm -hmm. day, uh, but I guess like, so, you know, you always hear horror stories of like suddenly my caregiver can't come anymore or something, or, or yeah. they were scheduled to show up, but they didn't arrive. And so, oh, yes. you know, <laughs> so, so that would be kind of, kind of uh, bad if that mm -hmm. happened. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what the best plan to deal with that is, but I, I guess yeah. we'll deal with it as it comes up. <laughs> well, I would say maybe don't wait until crisis arrives, but start now thinking about the future so that over the next couple of years, you can put a safety plan in place, a crisis plan in place, and then start recruiting other people to you know, be there to support you. When you get a fantastic job or move on to graduate school somewhere, um, you know, doing research, whatever your next step's going to be, mm -hmm. uh, maybe teaching class or something. I think that, you know, you're going to be finding yourself wanting more and more independence, you know? Mm -hmm. So it'll be good to start thinking about that. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I think we uh, actually empower him already starting from mm -hmm. his young age, uh, like since one year old. So my approach is like first improve my self problem solving skill so that we can slow down the um, disease progressing mm -hmm. so that he has still have energy to do what he can best do. Mm -hmm. And the second is like I'm serving the role model and keep improving me and the, and the share what I learned to him mm -hmm. and the trying to develop his like I call this champion mindset. It's not that you want to be champions like yeah. you want to be doing well, what kind of character you have to. So we are incorporate his daily activity, trying to improve his those characters mm -hmm. and trying to improve his problem solving skill. Getting in the MIT is also the way for him to financially independent mm -hmm. and having empower him with more better problem solving skill also prepare him into the more ultimate independent. Physically, he can never be independent, but mentally, mm -hmm. we want him as independent as he can. And well, right, you want you want him, and Ben, you want to be able to direct your caregivers. So what Jenny's saying is that she's trying to train you so that you can train other people how to take care of you and how to be part of your team. And it's really important that you get to that point where you'll be able to direct that care, hire and fire caregivers, you know, all of that and, and deal with a lot of the obstacles that are sure to come your way because yeah. that's just life. Yeah, and also, I also want to add that um, we are uh, specifically giving him a lot of opportunity to do the self-advocate. Mm -hmm. So he start have the, social media account, Facebook and the things since seven. So he started to doing the advocate for himself. Yeah. And then he was at age 11, he was the real disease patient ambassador. So he mm -hmm. will make some speech and do that. And the, in the high school and the, also the late of middle school, he served as a MDA, Muscular Dystrophy Association. Yeah ambassador for the San Diego Imperial mm -hmm. area for four years. And he makes speech, he raised a fund for them and talk to the policy maker, talk to the owner, store mm -hmm. owner, those things. And that appear in the TV station, make speech. So that also improve his self-advocate skills so that yeah. 
it will need to use for his future independence. Yeah, that is fantastic, guys. That's just fantastic. Thanks. So um, tell me about this mathematics award. So impressive. Sure. The, you mean the Alibaba Global mm -hmm. Math Competition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's like, it's a competition for it's open to anyone, like no age restrictions. Lots of the top scorers were graduate students, most of them actually, I think. Um, so anyway, uh, there's like 50,000 participants and um, I was in the top 70. So wow. I got a $5,000 award. And then you were able to go to Beijing and get the award at a ceremony. Yes, yes. Yeah, I gave a speech at the ceremony. And, it was um, so good. It was so good. Thank you. And but... the good, good thing is they provided the first class tickets uh, for two of us and the five-star hotel and also the meal plan for us every day. So it basically was invite to it was just show up over there and mm -hmm. and the, the his story was go wild yeah. in China. So you don't know how many people read his story and then when he go out, the people recognize him. Oh so, wow! Yeah, the, in airplane, in the, uh, every place he show up and the people was so happy meet him, want to take a picture with mm -hmm. him, but. You also talked about, you know, it was a 30 hour trip, which is extremely challenging for yes. someone with SMA and the worry that your wheelchair might not show up in one piece. You know, there's so many stories about wheelchairs and flying and then you get there and the building is not accessible. So you have to be carried up and in, in your wheelchair needs to be carried up uh, a flight to get upstairs to be able to get up on stage. Yeah. Was that frustrating for you or did you just take it in stride? Yeah, well, it was a little frustrating, but um, I also like, so um, so I feel like, yeah, it, it could have been like foreseen better, but um, on the other hand, like at, when on the scene, we saw that there was an issue. They also did a like good job, like trying to like, uh, get the necessary tools to hoist mm -hmm. up the chair, uh, which was uh, I was also appreciative of. Um, so, so finally, but, yeah, it was like uh, it was the big. They got like this this chair hoisting device, and they uh, hoisted it up like one step oh. step at a time, and yeah. and then they got a stretcher for me, and they they, <laughs> they put me up on the stretcher. <laughs> so, I mean, but when you think about it in this day and age to have buildings, public buildings that still have no access. It's, you know, it happens. It's everywhere. It's not just in China, it's everywhere. But it's like, it's so frustrating because you would think that by now we've caught on that we have to make everything accessible. But yes, no, definitely. haven't done that yet. Yeah, the, so, the hardest, let me add something. The yeah. harder thing is, after we get back, after th 34 hours fly from Beijing to Boston, I scheduled a special bus to pick us up at 12 o'clock in the morning. They didn't mm -hmm. show up. And, the, and then we are wandering in Boston streets Oh. For several hours, it's night, and the, the it's raining. Before that, that's frustrates situation. Yeah. We have several miserable encounter with uh, public Mr. transportation. Public transportation. Yes. The, yeah. It's just so bad. There are several. Mm -hmm. Even for us, just like stay here for one and a half years, we have three or four encounters. Mm -hmm. so I know I'm from Massachusetts. Uh, you know, this is where I do my show from. And uh, having okay. raised a daughter in a chair, I have to say it's it's very frustrating trying to get around. It's very frustrating trying to get 
um, in and out of buildings. There's mm -hmm. many stores that still have steps and they say, oh, we have an, we have a, you know, wheelchair friendly entrance, but it's in the back by the garbage, you know, yeah. and <laughs> like, no, no, this is not okay. Come on. We got to do better people. Uh -huh. But the thing is you keep raising awareness, you know, and I want to really go back to the discussion of inspiration versus motivation. And, you know, in our, in our disability community, we sometimes call it inspiration porn, which we were laughing about earlier before okay. I turned on the record button. <laughs> and that means that, you know, people are just you know, amazed at what you can do, Ben, because, you know, you have a disability or you're in a wheelchair. Instead of being amazed at the actual goals that you've accomplished, which are amazing for any human being on this planet, getting yeah. into MIT, it's, you know, like winning the lottery, except it's not winning the lottery because you earned it. And mm -hmm. then, you know, to be hitting that next level where you're, you know, competing at a global level in mathematics and you're just knocking it out of the park in every goal that you're setting for yourself, but it has nothing to do with your disability. It has everything to do with your resilience and your, your desire to achieve and to, you know, to be the best at everything that interests you. That's, <laughs> disability, non-disability, you know, that's an, an, an admirable person regardless. So that's what I find motivating because when I see someone like you, who's achieving at such a high level, at such a young age, I say to myself, oh, I have to work harder. I need to set some really important goals, you know? And I think that that's what mostly the public sees. Um, but we still get those people who are like, oh, that's so wonderful that you've been able to go to school, you know, uh -huh. that's so wonderful that your mom has come with you. Like, no, <laughs> we don't need that. We, we need you to stay in the motivation space, not the inspiration space. So, uh -huh. um, all of the press mm -hmm. that you've been getting, the followers that you have and your ability to communicate at a high level, you know, to the rest of us so that we can understand, you know, not just your challenges, but also like where you're going with all of this. And you don't want one minute to go by without making the best of it and the most of it. And yes, a lot of us don't do that. So <laughs> I want you to, uh, you know, I've already run over a little bit, but in the last, you know, couple minutes that we have left, Ben, can you just give some advice to a younger person who's in your shoes, wheelchair user, some physical disabilities, but who's setting goals for themselves, you know, how do they get from there to where you are? Yeah, well... I would say, um, well, sort of going off of what you were saying, uh, but like, I guess more abstractly, just like, don't lower your standards mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, um, you know, as you were saying, like society might expect that due to your disability, you know, it's like suddenly the smallest things are impressive or something. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what I call like lowering your standard. That's right. Uh, and uh so i i would say like don't do that instead like think uh just like um think of the bigger picture as just like you know a human being so like uh as a human being um i think we need to uh you know sort of ground ourselves in our values mm. and think about like uh what would what could i be doing now such that like even on my deathbed, I would still be proud of wow. what, yes. Um, so wow, that's great. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good uh, rule to live by. And um, yeah, so and another, another principle I like to employ is like, is to question everything. So yeah. I would say that like, you know, as a physicist and uh, as a mathematician, uh, often you ask questions about like why this works 
or mm-hmm. could it work in a different way? Or does this have to be like this? Yeah. But um, it's more like a way of living. Mm-hmm. Uh, like um, really in you, when you do, like when you're talking to someone, maybe you're having a disagreement and you can like, you know, ask yourself why this is. Or if, and um, so oftentimes you will learn something from that. Mm-hmm. And, or you could be talking, you could be thinking about like the way society is. And then you might also want to ask like, why is that? Yeah. Uh, and once you understand why, then you can start to change things for the better. Um, so yeah, I think, and and of course, ultimately like, why am I alive? Which comes back to the mm-hmm. things I was discussing earlier about like grounding yourself in your values and making sure everything you do is aligned with the bigger picture. Yes, yes. Bravo. That's an excellent answer. Love it. Love it. Could not agree more. I every day try to ask myself, am I still aligned with my goals and my principles? You know, am I still paying attention to my why for what I do? So, all right, um, Jenny, Uh what advice would you give to parents who are starting out on this journey, you know, having gotten a difficult diagnosis? and feeling that grief and that loss, you know, where do they go from here? How do they follow in your footsteps? Um, I would say first, never give up. Yeah. Second, you can always do better. Yes. Third, reach out for more support and the, and the glow yourself through the chore, like daily chore for me, like gardening, cooking, or try different way so you can grow yourself. Uh, and things, you, you can be better and better. Things, you, you, you can be better problem solving. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's some really good advice. Thank you both so much for coming on the show and sharing your, your journey, which is not even close to being over yet. And for giving us something to reach for. Um, It's so important, Ben, and I appreciate your time so much that you you were willing to stand up and to talk to us honestly about your experience and what life is like for you. As a parent, sometimes my daughter was nonverbal and I really, you know, I treasure getting inside your head a little bit and knowing what she might have been thinking because it was tough for her to communicate that with us. And so I I really am grateful for for you and for, you know, your extra effort to be part of the community and to continue educating us all. So thank you both so much for being on the show. Thank Thank you for having us.